Attention! Settle down and listen up and gather round. The tale we're here to tell, I warn you, may well break your heart. It's one of families torn apart by foul addictions, curse in spell. Good evening, everybody. Cheers. This is my eggnog. I'm Maya Jasper White. I'm the co director of Salstina. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, just a few things quickly about how it's going to go. Um, they, you have the option of enabling closed captions if you'd like. There's a little button at the bottom of your Zoom screen that says CC Live Transcript. So if you'd like to enable that, you can. Another thing that we really recommend this time, more than all the other times that we've had happy hours, is listening to the musical uh, material on YouTube live. So if you've been accustomed to doing this, you know the drill. If you don't wanna do it, you're welcome to stay in Zoom and you can hear the whole thing that way. But I can tell you that Kevin put countless hours into <laughs> mixing and mastering the audio to make it sound like nine different people who were in different rooms at different times, we're all in the same place. And, you know, just we owe it to him to listen to it the way that he wants it to be. So if you have it in you to try it out, Marissa will put a link in the chat box for how you can leave Zoom to listen to the music on YouTube Live and come back. So don't do it yet. We'll let you know how, but if you want to brush up on how to do it, we'll have the link in there. Um, so Chris Hunter, Bach and Vid Guerrero, the librettist, just told us what's going to happen in the plot of this coffee cantata. So I'm not going to belabor that. All will be revealed. But what I do want to do is set a little bit of context for you, historically speaking. So behind me, right there, is Cafe Zimmerman in Leipzig. And this cafe was the home of uh, the trendiest coffee shop of its day in the early 17th century. Sadly, it no longer exists because it was bombed out by the Allies in World War II. Um, but coffee was spreading like wildfire across Europe around 1700. And um, as is usually the case with things that people don't understand, it was pretty controversial. People thought that it was a petri dish for deviant behavior and they didn't quite understand the effects that coffee had on human beings. Um, at Cafe Zimmerman's, women were not allowed to um, come and drink coffee, but they were allowed to come and listen to the public concerts that occurred there um, every week or so. Cafe Zimmerman was Bach's favorite cafe. He went twice a week um, in his capacity as a patron and as music director of the Collegium Musicum in Leipzig, which um, we'd like to think you can sort of safely credit with uh, the advent of secular instrumental music 
being performed publicly and people enjoying it. So prior to that time, it was more about sacred music, things that have to do with religion and God. And the coffee cantata is definitely not that. It is full of sexual innuendo and general goofiness. Um, and people in its day thought it was hilarious and they ate it up, including all the women who were allowed to see it, but not to have coffee. And it's also worth noting that um, at Cafe Zimmerman, the owner, Zimmerman, shocker, um, he allowed people to attend the concerts for free so long as they bought some coffee, kind of like having a, a per drink minimum <laughs> at a bar these days. And he also didn't charge the musicians. So we really appreciate that spirit. Those of you who've been joining us for a lot of weeks now, this is our 37th consecutive event and we're really happy to be able to offer them for free. So now I'll turn it over to Kevin to um, tell you a little bit about what we've done to this cantata. So the humor, hi everyone, I'm Kevin. I'm the co-founder and co-director of Solistina. Um, the humor in the original libretto uh, doesn't really hold up that well uh, in today's time. I mean, we can relate to it, but it's not, uh, we would say, oh, that must have been funny in box time. Uh, but that was nothing that um, a clever, loving rewrite of the text couldn't uh, fix. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so it's just worth talking about the idea of authenticity for a moment. So, you know, there's a kind of authenticity uh, where you try to recreate everything that was there at the time of the composer, um, including musical practices, vocal practices, uh, the equipment that the musicians use, um, you know, all those kinds of things, uh, aesthetic choices. That's one type of authenticity. But we chose to focus on a different kind of authenticity, the authenticity of intent. And what we wanted to do was um, think about the kind of impact that Bach wanted uh, this piece to have. And so, um, you know, it, 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 for example, it's not like a, you know, seeing a work of art and trying to make a replica of it. We wanted to do something um, that was faithful to Bach's intention, um, but we weren't afraid to, uh, you know, bring modern sensibilities into it right now. So it's in that spirit that um, we're going to give you the, the coffee cantata in its um, fully restored, uh, sometimes raunchy and silly glory. You'll see. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to listen right now to the Coffee Addict's aria in its original form and then in Vid's modernized English translation. And we'll do this with um, the daughter's first aria here. And uh, I, th I believe there is a link in the chat. Yes, there is. Thank you, Marissa, uh, for the YouTube live link. And this might be a good uh, chance to test it out before we play the entire Coffee Cantata. Or you can stay here and listen to it in Zoom as well.
So um, I'd like to take a moment to uh, acknowledge Vid Guerrero. Vid was the librettist for this version of the Coffee Cantata. And um, you might know him if you saw Figaro 90210. Uh, Vid has taken it upon himself to um, 
redo the librettos for the De Ponte trilogy, Mozart's De Ponte trilogy. So there is uh, Figaro 90210 for the marriage of Figaro. Then there is Don Jovi for Don Giovanni. And then there is um, O.C. Fantute for Cozy Fantute. O.C. stands for Orange County. And we are working with Vid, we're partnering with him uh, to present O.C. Fantute. Um, in fact, we were going to, uh, the plans were to uh, have the live performance, the live premiere of this opera in June, uh, but then something small got in the way of that. Um, so uh, <laughs> we've done this version of the, the coffee cantata a few times live, but it has been uh, refined a few, uh, a few times. And so we are effectively premiering a new version of it this evening. And if you stick around after we play uh, uh, the video of our, the entire coffee cantata, um, we will have a um, peek behind the uh, creative curtain, and we'll hear from our director Brent, uh, our director Ben, <laughs> and Vid, and the performers as well. And uh, you can feel free to type any questions that might come up spontaneously. You can just put them in the chat, and we will collect them and try to um, address them uh, before the hour is over. And also at seven o'clock, what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna rewatch the cantata together and uh, do a sort of a play-by-play. -play. Um, so it's a real behind the scenes sort of look. And I'm hoping um, that everyone who was involved in production will be able to chime in at that time as well. So um, without any further ado, this is Salestina's version of the coffee cantata. Attention! Settle down and listen up and gather round. The tale we're here to tell, I warn you, may well break your heart. It's one of families torn apart by foul addiction's cursed spell.
I swear I'm going to get you clean. You have to shun that evil bean or no dessert for you. That's fine. Give me a latte, I'll make two. How about a bribe? Cut back your rations. Each cup that you give up will earn one of the latest fashions. The fashion I prefer is cold brew. I'll ground you, you like how that sounds, until you finally come to. Sure, ground me, just like coffee grounds, and pour the boiling water through. You've grown increasingly disturbed, this habit really must be curved. Go straight to bed, no supper. It's fine, long as I've got my cup up. Oh, really, what's the use? While well, you're hopped up on devil juice. Though I love my daughter dearly, though I love her dearly, clearly, she's not thinking clearly. I love her dearly, clearly she's not thinking clearly, she's clearly not, no she's not, though I love my daughter dearly, although I love my dearest daughter dearly, clearly she's not thinking clearly. Dearly, clearly, she's not thinking clearly. No, she's not thinking clearly. She's lost within this camping haze. So lost within this camping haze. Let's pray it's just a phase. In this caffeine haze, let us pray it's just our face. Let's pray. Yes, let's pray it's just our face. Just our face. Just our face. Just our face. face. You're lost within this caffeine haze. I pray it is just. Oh, that coffee breath won't land a mate. So you said I'm too young to date. You are, but I'll lift that restriction if you renounce your sick addiction. Coffee, fair is fair. All righty then, if that's the plan, I'll quit right now, no second guessing. I'll gladly drink my coffee for a man. And I will gladly give my blessing.
signature aroma faded. His daughter seemed so well behaved. He celebrated what he'd done, believing truly that he'd won. But that girl was one savvy sister. She kept her word while living in his house, but quickly found her future spouse. The sexy neighborhood barista. that um, you're going to have a lot of fun talking about the how the sausage was made in this particular instance. Um, firstly, I want to applaud everybody who was involved in the making of this. So we have, of course, Vid Guerrero, the librettist who was behind the <laughs> adaptation, Ben Crywash, our director who's also here, Annie Sherman, the soprano, Chris Hunter, the tenor, and Cedric Berry, the bass player, um, the instrumentalists. I think all of us are here too. We had Bernard Gordillo on harpsichord, Kevin and myself on the violin. There you are, Meredith on viola, Yoshi on cello and his bullet train in Japan, and Ben, our flutist. <laughs> so um, yeah, just want to start. Um, the conversation about what this was like to make during COVID times. I loved seeing everybody comment on the screen kiss. <laughs> we have some behind the scenes pictures of that plexiglass. Um, I also really wanna thank Marissa Winship, our stage manager extraordinaire, um, OC Music and Dance who hosted us um, doing this. And of course, Mainrad Brennis, the man of the hour who edited everything together. Um, so yeah, I could go on like Oscar style, but I'm sure you all have questions about how that was done and why we did it that way. Um, so I'd love to have Ben hop on now, our director, and tell us a little bit about, um, this is a very, very seasoned theater director and musical theater director. Um, and he was working with us from the Twin Cities, Minnesota. Um, so entirely over Zoom. So Ben Crywash, if you're still here, can you unmute yourself and say hello? Hi. Yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm actually in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, and I think the, the, the challenge of this uh, piece, uh, in addition to uh, making it uh, more immediately accessible, as Vid did such a wonderful job with the text, uh, was how to stage it in such a way that you work with the conventions of a uh, of a Bach cantata and of early opera, uh, but also do it in a way that um, uh, is emotionally real, uh, uh, even though it's not theatrically naturalistic at all, as opera is is not naturalistic at all. But it's very real, emotionally very real. So that was how I would I generally approach each piece. In this particular project, of course, we had the challenge of um, uh, not not just not even being in the same room at the same time, but none of the cast couldn't be together. 
And so uh, we decided to go with the approach of this is clearly a video mashup together of these uh, situations. We chose backgrounds that would make it clear they're not in the same space, either the characters or the um, uh, or the performers that they actually um, are in different head spaces. Uh, and then just trying to figure out how to deal with the uh, the mechanics of, of uh, you know, of editing and working with um, uh, orchestra as uh, uh, Kevin pulled together these uh, six different instrumental strands to um, uh, blend them together into the singular sound. And then we had uh, performers uh, singing to them. Uh, you could see in the, the earbuds uh, as they were listening to the orchestral track. So they were singing, you know, a cappella uh, uh, to those of us who could hear them during the course of the recording. Um, so trying to piece all that together was quite a challenge. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's challenging enough to, to mount any opera, um, uh, even more challenging if you're dealing with Baroque opera, which is so highly stylized. But then when you add the element of film and how you're going to translate a theatrical language to cinema, that's a challenge. Then you do all of that uh, in the COVID situation. Um, uh, so it was, um, um, uh, it was a fun challenge. I mean, you know, it was very engaging. We certainly were, over the course of the last few weeks, were very... Uh, very focused on figuring out how to make it work. And we had a great team, as uh, Maya said, um, both the well, backstage team and ben, the can wonderful I, cast. Can I just interject for one second? So, yeah. you know, during the process, before we started shooting, I mean, I would sometimes just ask Ben these questions mm -hmm. like, I just don't understand how this is going to work. How are you going to, you know, how are... <laughs> I mean, I would just ask him these questions and it speaks to how seasoned he is that that he was able to, you know calm calm everyone down without <laughs> making it obvious that he was calming everyone down i mean he would just kind of just gently talk through the, his process and um imagine directing you know directing this entire thing from i don't know two thousand three thousand miles away you know um just i just want to give you um props for not only you know not only your um your skills as a as a director, but but also just, you know, in how you handled this whole thing. So thank you for that. Well, thank you, Kevin. That's very sweet of you to say. I did mention at one point, it sort of felt like, uh, you know, I was in Houston Mission Control and talking to the astronauts up in the space station or whatever, trying to get them to move a little bit more this way or do a little bit of this or whatever. But I do want to acknowledge the cast too. I mean, they, they just dove right in. They were willing to go with this. Um, they did a fabulous job in performance. And they were very flexible as once we got into the space and uh, we were actually doing the taping, uh, very patient. Uh, it took twice as long as we had anticipated, of course, as they were working through the technical stuff. So um, it was a great team all around and their performances. I, my, my own orientation is toward the, the, the singing actor telling the story uh, through the music and they really, uh, they delivered. So I really appreciate all that that uh, Cedric and Annie and Chris brought to this project. Uh, they're the ones that make your experience what it is. Well, I'd love for you guys to introduce yourselves as well. Um, Annie, I see you first. Can you say hi and, and speak briefly about what your experience was like? Hello. Um, my, this was a lot of fun. Yay, uh, Annie, can all, I just say yay? Thanks. You were you were so awesome. <laughs> thanks. That was wild too. It was my first time seeing it too, so. I was chuckling along. Um, it was, you know, it's so fun to just have something to do, honestly, as a performer and to be <laughs> able to get into a studio <laughs> for the first time in a long time. Um, so that was a, a real treat. And then, you know, I haven't sung Bach in a while. So to to get back into singing something this, uh, you know, this old, really, but looking at it from a fun modern standpoint kind of made me realize what the whole appeal of of singing this music is you know it it encourages singers to get off of their voice off of their voice not in the sense of being not on the voice but um you know to lighten up <laughs> and um and not bring so much weight to the singing because it's just all in service of of the dramatics and the fun and funny text Awesome. And I saw you too, Cedric. Can you say hello? Of course. Thank you. Very glad to be here. <laughs> I second what Annie said. It was really our first time seeing it as well. And I was shocked. 
Well, particularly Cedric, in many of wanna, Andy's moves, yeah. You were awesome, too. I just want to give you applause. Thank, thank you. I really appreciate it. I was, I mean, I, we were just cracking up and looking at this and seeing Annie's reaction, I mean, or, you know, her loving the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Starbucks that she had in her hand. I believe me, Ben, had I seen some of her outtakes, it would have really influenced my reactions in the, in the storyline. They were great. That's and true. So I, first, Cedric. Pardon me? Cedric was in there first. They oh, that's to... right. I was I was the guinea pig yeah. at putting this all together, <laughs> and I would have to react to something that I was imagining as opposed to really seeing Annie there. But um, it was a very, 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 very uh, interesting experience in that, in that, you know, I many of you know that I am uh, the associate chair for the film school at USC. And, um, and we have been grappling with this, this idea of trying to create film over Zoom for mm -hmm. almost a year now. And, 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 and I have to say, we have stellar faculty there that did a really, 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 really good job of putting this together. In fact, it was highlighted in a, a lot of the, the magazines about you know breaking ground on doing this sort of thing. So to my surprise, when I walked into the studio, they had basically the exact same setup that our faculty put together for our students for their films in Zoom. So it was a very professional setting, very well done, very cutting edge, and now I know that it works. I, and I have to give a shout out to a couple USC faculty members who are here today. Amanda Pope is here, great documentarian, and uh, Nancy Forner, one of the premier editors in Los Angeles is here and on our faculty and part of our, is the head of our um, editing track at USC. So thank you guys Wonderful. for pre giving me uh, a bit of a clue into what I'd be doing unbeknownst to me. <laughs> well, you know, I imagine that um, for you and Annie, it was probably like um, acting with green screen or something like that. You know, I oh, mean, yeah, there's yeah. no, yeah. Well, there was really no, I mean, I, I just, I try to imagine myself doing that, but I mean, there was no, and I can't, there was just no feedback there at all. So you're just, you know, acting to an imaginary person basically, right? Right. Well, the funny well, thing is that's what you have to do in an audition, right? right? Ah, Every time okay. You go in to yeah to to perform an aria or a song, a musical theater song or something. There's yeah. always going to be those moments where you know that someone else is supposed to be responding, and you just have to, as I say, act for two. Right. But the but what makes it really tricky is that now there's actually another person who's going to be layered in, so you can't just totally make up what they're gonna right. what they're gonna react like because right. you don't know. <laughs> you know who I want to know. Oh, sorry, Ben. You know who I want to know how he reacts is Vid. <laughs> Vid, are you here? What did you think? It's the first time you've seen it too. Uh, it, it is. I, I can't believe you guys pulled this together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, genuinely, I, I, I'm shocked. I, I received a, a few text messages of, of a video from Maya filming her screen with her phone <laughs> saying recording's going well, but otherwise that was it. I, I was like, I, we'll see. Um, I just, I mean, props to everyone involved in the production. I mean, first of all, um, let's just talk, it's great music. Um, and so uh, like, I, there was so much involved in this that I want to build from like the ground up is, you know, of course, we're also used to Celestina giving us such high quality music. So I just want to start there. Um, spectacular Thank playing you. from everyone. But this is this is unquestionably a flute virtuoso piece, yeah, um, so especially to Ben. I mean, everyone's great, but I mean, there's there's a lot going on for that flute to hear. So wonderful job. Um, the singer is um, like so funny and, and great. And I can't believe you guys pulled this off. <laughs> in uh in social distancing um uh and yes you, you you all you all made me laugh uh which i i think is uh i think is what Bach was after totally um, so hopefully other people as well were were, were laughing like i was uh on mute because um yeah I, I i think when you have something that is both beautiful music well executed and bring a smile to people's faces. I'm like, well, wh what else do you need, especially in these times? <laughs> so, like, real props to everyone. Yeah, thank you, Vid. Well, um, something yeah, okay. is is Chris here? I just want to make sure that Chris isn't here. I know he was going to try to make it, but I just want to make sure he he's not under a different name. Chris, if you're here, you can unmute yourself. I or I'm not sure how we can do that. No, type in the chat if you are, and then we'll we'll get back to you. Okay, sorry, Maya. 
Um, sounded like Ben Crywash wanted to add something. Uh, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, you know, to to Cedric's point and and with Vid saying that, you know, it's surprising that we pulled this together. I said from the beginning to Maya and Kevin, I said, when this is over, we're going to know what we should have done. Right. We're going to we're going to have we're going to have it figured out after the fact. So that's just part of the process. I think that all of us artists uh, have been placed in this position of having to shift our thinking mm -hmm. about how we deliver the art that we do. Uh, just given the circumstances and that'll change hopefully by this time next year and things will be different and and we will have all of these tools now in our toolbox in addition to what we already do not in place of what we already do right yeah and uh, you know when we we're talking about the singers i just want to give props to all the the um instrumentalists i almost said musicians like singers aren't musicians you know right, right. <laughs> um, but uh so what we did was we had Yoshi, Yoshi's in Japan, and he recorded some of this, he's a resident cellist, and he recorded some of this from Japan and sent it over. And um, he recorded this to click. And then um, after that, we each, you know, added our lines to his recording without the click to try to make it feel as, as natural as possible. So in a sense, we had to do something similar to what you guys are, um, Annie and Cedric are saying, which is we had to kind of anticipate what everybody else would want to do with their parts and um, and imagine that we were playing with everybody else too. So I just want to give, uh, you know, uh, acknowledgement to to um, the instrumentalists as well. I'd also like to, um, you may have noticed in the end credits that we dedicated the video to the memory of Warner Henry. So um, I'm sure many of you who are on this call um, don't need to um, hear from me who Warner was, but for those of you who don't know who Warner was, he was one of the Southern California area's most just generous um, philanthropists of our art form and a real champion of the art form. And his favorite composer was Bach. And um, as much as I knew him more in a kind of professional sense, I, there was still, I knew him well enough to see the twinkle in his eye and heard enough stories from other people about just how much he loved mischief. So we felt that between those two things, um, with Warner having passed in August, um, it was a good way to honor his memory. And also Warner was, and his wife Carol, were the first people that we told about O.C. Fantute. Um, That's right, yeah. They are um, such devoted opera lovers and supporters, and um, we just had a feeling they'd get a kick out of it. And it makes me very sad that Warner will never have the chance to see it, but hopefully he's smiling down on this. Yeah. I have say that um, one of our uh, most significant patrons of Solestina has offered to match up to $10,000 that we raise tonight um, in Warner's memory. He was very, very good friends with Warner. Um, so uh, if you enjoyed our coffee cantata and look at it as a proof of concept for OC Fantute, you can actually commission an aria in OC Fantute and Marissa will pay something in the chat box about that. Um, that starts at $100. If you're in a position to help us bring that show to life, we hope that you will consider it. And um, it's going to be really fun and special and certainly with less restraints than we've been working with for the yeah. coffee. And um, if you if you don't know what to get someone for Christmas, this right. this might be the thing. Exactly. <laughs> so now's the time when we start taking questions from the audience. And like Kevin said, um, at 7, we will actually rewatch the piece in chopped up bits so that there will be more that questions can remain fresher in your mind if you want to say how did you do this um, but for now let's take a look through and see who has questions um, can we just really quickly I just want to see if David Dunford is on and we can just um, say hi if you're here David just to um, you know because what we did was uh, this is a, a facility a teaching facility and they actually have a a uh, black box theater space. This is in Irvine. And, um, you know, they were gracious enough to set up for us. And this was, I think, uh, even though they have done filming there, they've done other things like, uh, you know, for their students. I think this was the first kind of thing of first thing of this kind that they've, they've done. And, um, and just a huge thank you to them for, for taking that step with us and, um, you know, accommodating all of our requests as well. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. It was it was a real learning experience for us too. I mean, this entire year has been a learning experience for everyone. And the nice thing about it was it was, you know, it was a 
uh -oh, collab thing because everybody knew that everybody was learning. And so we were figuring out how to get three cameras streamed through Zoom so that uh, Ben, the director, could actually look at the different shots to figure out how to line it up, all the while recording the audio with uh, sending the feed to the headphones and then sending the audio feed with the video there. And then turning that off, and I think Marissa had to turn the speaker on and off all the, every time Ben wanted to say <laughs> something, otherwise we'd get feedback. So it was a real learning curve, but we we started to get the hang of it. So it was a really great experience, and uh, the team really had a great time working with all of you. Thank you, thank you. And you know, I have to say, um, you know, when we were uh, trying to uh, starting to put together, you know, our plan for OC Fantute, you know, um, we kept on getting warned that look. Uh, you guys present concerts, but presenting an opera is a different animal, totally, you know? And I think we definitely got a taste of that in just trying to make this one, you know? I mean, so many different moving pieces together, and then not to mention, like, obviously doing this remotely as well. So um, I, I just, I don't think we can thank everybody who was involved in this enough for, you know, like Ben said, all of their patience and talent and, and willingness to do this with us. So thank you. Um, okay, so we have some questions. Let's see. Let's see. So David Cadell asked, what is the modern equivalent of recitative and aria? Did I nominate you to answer that one? <laughs> um, I, it's, it's, it's scene and song. I mean, it's, you, do, you do a comic scene and then you break into song. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> that's the musical comedy version, at least. Um, I, I assume there, there, there are all sorts of other versions, you know, that we could, uh, um, you know, I, I think that in, in popular music, there is a, there's a great tradition of a, of a, of a, of a semi-spoken, especially in duets, of a, of a semi-spoken uh, verse and then a song chorus. I think especially in, in pop music um, and by semi-spoken, it's often the kinds wrapped. Um, that's a that's a very very frequent I think uh, very similar outgrowth of it where you kind of have two people telling a story through a verse and then they'll break into a more kind of uh, melodically complex sung chorus. So uh, it's it's all it's all it's all music. It's all the same stuff spinning around. <laughs> yeah, Ben, go ahead. Ben. I was just gonna say I was just gonna second what Vid said and that that oftentimes the recit is to basically to give a setup. Here's the situation. And then the song is, here's how I feel about it. Um, and, uh, and so therefore the song is more uh, emotionally expansive, more musically complex. The rest of it is, is very quickly, let's get this information out. And to the popular song that Vid mentioned, you know, a lot of the great American songbook, uh, songbook songs have a verse, then you've got sort of the, the song that we know. And oftentimes the verse is dropped in a recording. If you hear it in a cabaret act, sometimes they'll begin with the, the opening opening a, a verse that nobody knows. And then when the, they launch into the song prop, everybody applauds because they recognize the song, but they didn't know that there was a verse to that because that oftentimes gets dropped. And you hear that with uh, all the Gershman tunes and Cole Porter and all of that sort of thing. So that's sort of the, the equivalent, but ultimately, yeah, it's the spoken scene going into a song and say in a Broadway musical. Um, Stephen Unwin had a question about uh, how, the music, how we all recorded. Um, you said uh, no visual cues to help. That's correct. So um, actually, we're looking at this as uh, this version of the coffee cantata that you saw. We're looking at it as kind of like a sneak peek at what will be the final version uh, because the musicians did. Uh, we are going to have a mosaic of the musicians during the final chorus where you can see everybody who was, you know, uh, all, all the musicians playing on it. But we do not do this by video. Um, you know, we... Uh, I mean, part of the reason why it works is because um, we all play with each other a lot and we, you know, know what the other people are going to do, the kinds of, um, you know, ways of being expressive, you know, or things that we can anticipate. Um, we say this a lot too, but, you know, a lot of us um, in Celestina make our living, uh, you know, partly by being studio musicians. So we're used to playing, um, you know, two click tracks or two recorded, pre-recorded music and putting our you know, our own playing on top of it, but knowing how to do it in a way that still is expressive while, you know, um, adhering to the boundaries that we have. So, um, you know, I don't think that anybody's crazy about doing it this way. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't say that we would choose to do it this way, uh, but we know how to do it this way. Um, it is pretty great. What's so, that? Mute is nice. <laughs> Just go downstairs. 
Sorry, what? The commute. Oh, the commute. Yes, that is one thing we definitely do not miss. I mean, I would drive, you know, something like five hours a day, you know, to do the studio work. And it looks like there's some other studio musicians here. <laughs> so they know what we're talking about. Um, but yes, working from home, there, there's, um, you know, there's, there's its own charm to doing recording this way. Um, let's see. We are at seven o'clock now. So what we do for all of our ha happy hours, and we encourage you, if this is your first time attending one of our Celestina happy hours, um, you know, we, like Maya said, this is our 37th one. We are continuing, we're going to continue for, you know, as long as we can to do these happy hours. We're finding that we're reaching an audience that's, uh, uh, has a wide geographical spread. Um, you know, we enjoy doing these every week as well. So um, we encourage you to attend future happy hours. And what we do uh, every week is at seven o'clock, we have a soft out. The event formally sort of ends, but right now it becomes sort of a hang. And we have a plan for today's hang, which is to, um, are we gonna watch each piece and then sort of, you know. So like the first recit and the first aria, and then like, hey, okay, question, question, and then so Marissa and I kind of figured out what those discrete punks would be. Awesome. Okay. So are we doing that just here in Zoom or are we going to do that also in YouTube? Keep it in Zoom. Yeah, let's just keep it in Zoom. Okay. So please, um, you know, type any more questions we're, we're going to answer. Hey, yeah, I have I, a quick question. Yeah. Right before you start the replay, just because um, I, I have no idea why, and I'm curious if you can talk about the why. Um, so you mentioned Yoshi laid down his part first yeah. to click track. So the bass instrument or whatever. Um, what's the rationale for that? Um, and would it be different if it were a different composer? Why not the most complex or the most expressive part um, laying down first? Um, just you mean the violin? The of, I mean the flute, <laughs> actually. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> just the flute. Like We need more Ben in our lives. Um, but, no, I'm kidding. No, but like, like why the why the bass instrument why the cello first and then is there does it go up from there in pitch or like how, just how does it how and why mm -hmm. well um so in this piece what we have i mean and from that time you know what we have is something called continuo right which is the bass line and then we have um, an instrument which fills in the harmonies and um you know they have the moving part in um in this entire uh, piece, right? And, and a lot of music from that time. So uh, we thought it would make the most sense if the the instruments which had the moving lines and which actually provide the, you know, the harmonics uh, sort of foundation recorded first. Um, usually that's, that's our approach. Uh, like some ensembles, you know, they don't really like things led from the bottom, you know, um, but we find that there's a greater... Um, I don't know, sort of cohesiveness and, um, you know, when the impetus comes from, from the bass. So, um, yeah, Yoshi says you should know the answer to that. You're a cellist as well. Um, so, you know, in this case, we asked Bernard, our, our harpsichordist, and Bernard actually went, that's not a keyboard sound. I mean, if you listen on YouTube, you can hear what a fantastic sound this is, and that is uh, the sound of one of Curtis Barak's uh, harpsichords. And uh, Bernard actually traveled twice to, uh, to Curtis's studio downtown. Uh, Bernard is uh, in the Inland Empire, and he traveled all the way there twice to record this, and he captured a, a beautiful sound. And we asked Bernard, you know, what would you prefer? Would you prefer for, you know, the cello to be there first, or would you like to do it? And he requested that the cello go first. And um, yeah, I mean, I think this approach, I don't know, it just it somehow worked. And I think also because the harpsichord um, does a lot of, um, what's the word, like it fills in a lot of the you know, the harmony and also like figures and all kinds of things. I think it gave Bernard a chance to kind of uh, be a little bit more free with what he could do. So somehow it worked out. Just Thanks so you guys um, continue, like what Bernard the harpsichordist was doing was he's playing note for note the cello part in his left hand and then completely improvising the rest. So that's on the fly work. That's a skill set that is unique to um, early music specialists and a very cool one. So yeah, I think yeah. having Yoshi lay down the left hand or the, you know, the continual line first gives Bernard a little bit more comfort to sort of do his thing above. 
Um, it also just, it's really easy. One word answer too is intonation. <laughs> you always tune from the bottom. So um, if, if Yoshi plays a note, even if it's wrong, it is now right because that is what's happening. <laughs> That's just the way it Violinists goes. tend to need chalice sorry. in order to play in tune. What? <laughs> Did I hear <laughs> now? Was that Yoshi? <laughs> yeah, I think he, he spoke up when I uttered the word intonation. <laughs> Go for it, Yoshi. Maybe he's not. Uh, well, huh. shall we rewatch? Oh, he said, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 Nothing to apologize for, Yoshi. Oh, and Susan Hellauer was on too, uh, from Anonymous Four. Thank you so much. If you're still still on, thank you. <laughs> okay. Oh, Chris. Chris is here. Chris, do you want to just say hi? Hi, everyone. I, I'm so sorry. I had seven on my calendar, and and uh, but I'm so happy to be here, and it's so nice to see you all. And this is such a fun project. Well, bravo to you for your performance, and and we're gonna actually kind of rewatch it right now, and and um and hey. take questions. So, <laughs> welcome. All right. Here goes. Attention! Settle down and listen up and gather round. The tale we're here to tell, I warn you, may well break your heart. It's one of families torn apart. By foul addiction's cursed spell was one of those things Ben was talking about, like, how would we have known? Ben had chosen these backgrounds for all the different characters to be projected onto the wall. And um, at the venue, they had, they were using three cameras. It was a three camera shoot. So kind of a far away um, view, a mid range view and a close up view. And we learned the hard way that if you're not using the same camera for all three, the way they read color is different. So <laughs> that meant that when we would cut from one camera to the next, and poor Mainrad, the editor, had some amount of color correction to do. And you may notice that Annie, especially in one of them, just looks a little pinker <laughs> than in another angle. And that's because that was kind of the best we could manage. So um, another detail about that, um, another fun fact, was that the backgrounds sort of didn't read 
with the cameras in the same way, period, like not just with color in terms of pixelation. And if it looked like they were moving and you know, these things are, it's just like, we got to the place and, and also Ben and Kevin and I are watching this unfold over zoom and trying to gauge, you know, what camera we're we going to use for this. So that's totally not our wheelhouse. And I was joking with Kevin that it felt like we became a classical music production company overnight, <laughs> just sort of producing these these music videos. Um, but it's just the world we live in, I suppose. Anyways, if there are any camera experts, well, can enlighten us about why that was. And I, I just also want to thank the singers for providing their own costumes. <laughs> we had a, a oh Ben, did you want to say something? Oh okay. Um, we had a meeting, you know, we, so all of our rehearsals clearly, I mean, we, they all happened over Zoom, you know, and um, and I also wanted to mention that um, the way that we uh, got the singers um, recordings to practice to, right, because, um, you know, this is the first, I mean, this there's no recording of Vid's libretto for, for the coffee cantata. So um, the way we got them music to practice to was uh, we would take the audio from our Zoom sessions. We would record the Zoom sessions. We would, um, they would sing the recitatives um, over Zoom, and then we would take that audio, and then I brought it into, you know, um, an audio editing software, and I would insert a really corny, cheap-sounding harpsichord and the sample cello, and we would put that underneath so they know they would have pitch references, and then send that to them, and um, and that's also what they use in their ears as well while they were recording the recitatives. So, you know, we, what we did was they sang the recitatives. We, I took that bare audio and then Bernard and, and Yoshi, they recorded their parts to the recitatives and they have to have ESP and some kind of superpower to anticipate because Ben definitely, um, you know, encouraged the singers to just approach the, the recits as, as conversations, you know. So um, it didn't follow any kind of a meter. There's no click track for that at all. So again, props to, to Bernard and Yoshi for that. Uh, you're muted, Maya. You're muted. You'd think I'd get the hang of it after 37 of these. Yeah. Um, but the, the thing that blew my mind the most about um, the recits was just what a team effort it was. Like in real life, it would have been two people bouncing off of each other in a kind of naturalistic way. But over Zoom, it was sort of like, Ben giving encouragement, then Kevin taking the recording from Zoom and chopping it up and making three versions. One is like the complete version. The other one's the version without Annie so that right. Annie can be herself reacting to Cedric. And then the third version was um, no Cedric so that Annie could do, wait, did I get that right? See, I can't even explain what it was, but you get the <laughs> sort of like each singer needed to have a version minus their part so that they could respond you know Annie you even put it one time like I, you mean I'm gonna have to memorize both of our lines <laughs> so just having like the recording of Cedric's lines is helpful to give you some um, something to act off of um, but that just was such a multi-fold process to kind of get to that point and then Kevin ended up putting in some clicks underneath that so that the harpsichord could time the, the continuo could time musically with what they'd done and that's so much effort for something that should be like you know fluff kind of coming out of your sleeve yeah and, uh, we should uh, point out that one of the reasons it had to be done that way is that that you couldn't actually have them rehearse at the same time uh because the, there's a time lag a delay in zoom uh, so that although some spoken theater things can be done live on Zoom, uh, when you're involved with music and the timing becomes so crucial, it's just not possible. So we really had to piece it together like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and also, um, you know, we took COVID precautions, just so everybody knows. Yeah. Um, all the singers got uh, COVID tests before they went in, and they, we, we did not want them in the room at the same time, you know, and um, so... Yeah, I mean, this was, this was, they were, this was all flying blind. And so yeah, I think what we're, what we're circling around is just like how much work and how much, um, how much we had to draw on everybody's like, you know, just wealth of experience, right? Just to put together, you know, this, this, this video. Yeah. And, and Chris, anticipation. 
Yeah, like a lot of anticipation. You, know, you, know, yeah. you had to sort of project ahead and say, here are the things we might run into. And then you prepare for those. And some of them will happen and some of them won't. And some things will happen that you didn't anticipate. And then you have to improvise. Yeah. Um, Chris, oh, I was just going to say, Chris, if you wanted to just talk about the experience from your point of view, um, I'm sure everyone would love to hear it. Yeah, yeah. It was um, like, like just right here, this is the first time that I've, um, that I've seen Cedric sing any of that, um, which is which is awesome. Cedric, you sound wonderful as always. Um, yeah, I mean, luckily for for me, um, I know Annie and Cedric had all of the the resets where they're bouncing back and forth, and it's a lot, and you know, longer prolonged resets. So for me, I just had you know one rest at the beginning and one at the end, and it's all me as as kind of the uh, omniscient narrator, if you will. Uh, the so, sexy neighborhood barista. You mean? Yeah. Well. Yeah. 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 It's the you know, I just want you to get all to know that Chris actually added that himself into the. the I'm, <laughs> I'm just, just kidding. <laughs> That's not true. Uh, oh, it's true. It's true. <laughs> well, it, it, it had, you know, it just. And we know. did get Viz permission on that, though. We did. <laughs> it's it's just uh, you know you got to sprinkle a little of yourself into it. So, <laughs> so that is my contribution. Thank you. Um, yeah, but, but all, all, all I had to do was go in there and, and sing it. So I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear how beautifully the, uh, um, the accompaniment for the resets came together. Really lovely job. In the trio at the end also, I, I had the privilege of hearing Annie and Cedric in my ear where I think Cedric just went in and <laughs> laid it down. Okay, yeah. So actually, that's a good point because someone asked, it was Brian, right? Like, why do you do the cello first? So it was the same with the singers, not just because it was the schedule that we made, but Cedric has the lowest voice. Like the cello is the lowest string instrument. So he went in first and he recorded his part just with our backing track. And then after that, it was Annie's turn. And so in real time, the staff at the venue, OC Music and Dance, put Cedric's track on top of our backing track so that Annie could hear it. Then when Annie was done, they layered Annie's track in so that Chris could hear it, you know, so that every consecutive person had the benefit of hearing what it, what they were working with underneath. And uh, like Kevin said before, it just sort of gives a more natural um, feel than just kind of being in a vacuum. So um, anyway, all that being said, since we were just talking a lot about how the resets were done, it might be nice to watch the next chunk. Okay, yeah. um, because that's a kind of back and forth with Cedric and Annie. And now that you know how we did it, I think you'll applaud them and Kevin all the more for um, the execution. I'm here to save you all I gave you. Why would you throw it all away? Let's get you clean today. Oh, Daddy, don't make such a scene. We all have ways to get our
Something you guys might have noticed when we, at the very beginning, when we watched the original Aria and then the adaptation, is that the adaptation is quite a bit shorter. <laughs> so that is on purpose. So this this was something that we talked about a lot um, in preparing everything. Um, there's a convention of form in Western classical music that you kind of do the A section and then you do the B section and then you do the A section again. And there's this kind of circular, nice shape to that. Um, people really like it. It's as natural as one, two, three, you know, it just feels right. But when you're talking about telling a story, a narrative, it can come across as really repetitive and not necessarily part of our vernacular. So we made the choice to do away with the repeat of the A section. So basically Annie would have gone, oh, I need my coffee, hi, and then, again and then you'd just be kind of sitting there like okay we heard that and yes you'd enjoy some more fine singing but from a storytelling point of view so, yeah we also i mean we we cut out um i mean what ben tried to convince us to cut out every single instrumental <laughs> interlude in this piece well that's not entirely true <laughs> Not entirely true. No. no, no. We, I mean, the way that you described it, I mean, it made perfect sense. You know, so actually, um, I think the version that you know we had first referenced in the beginning of the happy hour, I think that is about twenty-six minutes or something like that, and our version is maybe sixteen minutes. You know, so we actually trimmed out ten minutes of of music, and um, get lots we, of thumbs down on YouTube for that because <laughs> purists are mean. <laughs> Well, Ben, do you want to just speak to that a little bit? Well, yeah, I mean, it has to do with the musical dramaturgy. I mean, the the story that's being told is relatively simple, but the way music works, especially in so sort of, you know the the pre classical Baroque era, it's it's a different the 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 role that music plays and the structural aspects of music are more important because they were still in the process of kind of working out the musical language of Western classical the Western classical canon. By the time you get to Verdi and Puccini, it's a whole different way of using music to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And I think oftentimes directors will try to apply the rules of more contemporary dramaturgy to a piece like this. And you have to honor the fact that this is a very stylized form. Um, but then uh, if you're dealing with a stage production, you usually have a, 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 like a scenic world, you've got props, you've got business that you can use to fill in uh, as long as it sort of tracks with the emotional reality of it. And in this case, we didn't have that. So um, uh, with the cinema language, it just made more sense to trim it up and keep moving forward as much as possible. The interludes are important, not just musically, but also, uh, especially when you've got performers like we have here, they're able to keep the space alive. Yeah. You know, and so you see what their performers are doing during the interludes as much as possible, we try to say, this is there's an emotional reality, even if we're not dealing with theatrical naturalism. Mm -hmm. How do you keep the emotional through line uh, through? And you know, I would love to have had even more rehearsal with them. We had very truncated rehearsal uh, time, and that was just part of the practicality of the situation. Mm -hmm. um, but they did a wonderful job, and so they. I think what we ended up with was a nice compromise. Yeah, um, um, and and it works well. Well, uh, Annie, Annie, can I? Can I you know, you took this aria about coffee and like just being there in that frame but i don't know you just like you totally sold it <laughs> i mean <laughs> caffeine you know and like you know and then and just dancing around and stuff within that little space because we couldn't really move out of frame right yeah thank you thank you kevin um yeah you know i i just wanted to it, we're just here to have fun and i you know i was just trying to think about what what I relate to in this woman's excitement. First of all, I love coffee, so that's not a stretch. Um, I really was. And, you, and she literally was. Cold yeah, she <laughs> she was drinking the whole Guys, time. Guys, <laughs> it was. I left that studio at 9 p.m. and I'd had like so much. I was hot up. <laughs> but um, so that could be some of it. But um, but you know, I mean, I I really identified with the fact that this this woman was. Not only did she really like coffee, and it was this kind of substitute for this unplaced desire that she had that, that she was not allowed to um, act upon, but that 
the loving the copy was also almost just like a knife turn for the dad. And I <laughs> definitely can relate to trying to needle your, my parents and <laughs> the things that, that I do that annoy them. You really, you you press on the gas even more. So I found that, you know, an, an easy motivator for, for loving the copy that much more. Yeah. It was wonderful. Um, Joan had a question. Um, Joan, if you are on, you can just, can, Marissa, can people unmute themselves right now? Okay, so you can just unmute yourself, Joan. Joan K, I believe, right? Yeah, let's see, I'll ask to unmute. And if we, um, if Joan doesn't uh, join us shortly, then we had a question for Vid. Yeah. Um, Jason, would you like to ask your question? Sounded like Keon seconded it. Yeah, so my, my question was for Vid, and it was about the challenges and joys of writing a libretto to music that already exists. And I was wondering if any of the clever lines emerged from the music, right? Like, as you were trying to figure out something that fit the meter or whatever, did, was, that, was that an impetus for some of the good jokes? I mean, the, I mean how, how I write for these projects is entirely uh, comes from the music. Um, I, I have to say that this was, this was a different project. So the, the three other kind of projects that I've done in terms of translating existing librettos, uh, it, it's very, it, this is very different from that. And that the Mozart opera is that um, I've mostly focused this part of my writing on um, are, I, I don't know the word is, it, it, from a musical perspective, there's a greater level of development in them. And that comes from being kind of classical era works as opposed to Baroque era works. And so even if there is repetition within libretto, uh, there's not direct musical repetition. And so when I, and also on top of that, the stories being part of a larger opera that, you know, the, the, the De Ponte trilogy, they are more complex. The characters are more multifaceted. And so there are more opportunities to take those instances of what are repetition in the libretto, but not in the music and embellish upon them. And so in the operas that I've translated, there's there are very few instances of direct repeats. And uh, when Maya first approached me for this project, which I, Maya, I'm, I'm gonna spill some, some of the dirt and this is, you know, in terms of how this came together. Uh, but literally Maya came to me and said, oh, we're doing a coffee cantata in four weeks. <laughs> do you by any chance wanna do a, you know, do a new libretto for it? <laughs> And uh, as with most being cases, generous, I believe it was only two weeks out. Maybe it was. It uh, was, maybe, yeah. Maybe it was. And I said, when are you going into rehearsal? Um, and so I said, no. Uh, and uh, I said a pretty hard no. And then I sat over the night thinking about all the reasons why it was absolutely impossible. Uh, and then I wrote back to her at noon the next day and said, okay, so I have two of the, I have two of the numbers written. When do you need it by? Um, and the discovery in that was that um, because of how the music is written and how the music treats the libretto, that writing to the music actually was not going to be the right approach for this. And that what I needed to do was literally write to the libretto um, in terms of syllable and meter and match the libretto exactly um, and let box ornamentation of it sit. That somehow reinventing his um, prosody was not gonna work for this. So whereas it's a 26 minute piece, if I had written to every syllable, there's no way it would have been done of the music, but writing to every syllable of the libretto and letting box repetition and letting what was, you know, these days we think of what is naturalistic for singing and that it needs to always fit the scansion of how you would speak something, right? So if the meter is something is, the emphasis is always on the right syllable. Baroque music is very different. And if you think about like Handel's Messiah, it's like, it's all over the place. Like it, he'll change the emphasis of a syllable to syllable to syllable. Right, and within the multiple times that a, a, a line is repeated, it changes. And that's part of the Baroque aesthetic. And once I realized that trying to fix that was, um, it was going to be betraying the actual music, I realized, well, this is now doable because while it's a 26 minute mini opera, it's actually only a three page libretto. 
Um, so this was an interesting challenge on that level. And I hope that's not too nuts and bolts for what you were asking. Um, so once I kind of did it that way, the, the, the mechanics of it became very, very specific um, about, well, how do you take, um, you're not going to be able to stand in front of the window and let people watch you from the balcony. I, 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 I'm like, okay, I, I guess that makes sense. Um, and rather than, um, I think, kind of invent overly hip translations of that into contemporary language, I decided to go more with coffee puns. I thought that um, those would be at least timelessly insufferable <laughs> as opposed to... <laughs> as opposed to so specifically of the moment. And so there, there was, there was a, a lot of back and forth about, was, should I make a reference to Instagram? No, I, like, I, I think, so I, I, I kind of went the, on the level of, yeah, timeless insufferableness is, is, is <laughs> of puns. Well, which... <laughs> while we're there, um, so in the slideshow, we, the trivia question was, um, which of the following threats does the father character not levy against the daughter in the original? So here were the options. Number one, I will buy you no whalebone dress of the latest fashion. Number two, you won't go to any wedding parties or even go out for walks. Number three, you may not stand by the window and watch anyone passing by. Number four, you'll also not receive from my hand a silver or gold ribbon for your bonnet. And number five, you will have to content yourself with never having a husband. Any guesses? The right answer is that all of them are in the libretto. <laughs> so again, like like Vid was saying, those those just don't hold up. You know, it's it's obviously coming from a time period in which women couldn't even go have a coffee, but they could go watch a uh, cantata about how devious deviant it is for them to enjoy coffee. Yeah just a strange thing and yet we we go to so many or oh the co oh yes Bach. Coffee. you know it's it's a silly piece you know so it, it deserves to be if you're really going to honor the intent of the composer i personally think that this kind of rewrite is more authentic than a kind of dusty faithful this is exactly the the german word that pickhander wrote and let's make sure that we really pronounce all the german sounds and syllables that's just kind of yeah. how we roll. Um, you know, uh, Vicki Kirsch had a question about how the cuts uh, in, impacted the singers. And it, I just want to mention Vicki Kirsch because, I mean, she's kind of proof that it takes a village to raise a cantata. I mean, like, to, uh, like just for us to know which singers to, a to ask, um, you know, that came from Vicki Kirsch. Um, she introduced us to Annie and Cedric, and then Annie introduced us to Chris. And, um, you know, I mean, we have very, you know, deep connections throughout the classical music world, but, but not, um, not in this particular part of that world, you know. So, um, so you know, we have to draw on, on friends. And, I mean, Vicky has, you know, Vicky knows, I feel like Vicky knows everybody. Um, and she knew, you know, exactly who to suggest for, for a project like this. And so the answer to that is it definitely did uh, impact them. I mean, I think we sent Cedric one of his cuts um, the night before he actually went into film. So, you know, we decided, you know what, something about this is not quite working. I think we need to, you know, cut this or that. And, and just to be honest, we actually continued to cut during editing after all of the shooting was done. So, um, you know, um, so it affected their, their learning process and, you know, everything was off book. The singers did not have the music in front of them. And they really put this, this together in like record time. I mean, it was amazing. And, um, and also like one of the cuts, Annie at one point was like, um, you know, I'm, I use my, I like, I have to breathe somewhere. <laughs> you know, one of the cuts was like, maybe we should, you know, we, we suggested a cut where Annie would sing just non-stop with melismas and just you know it, it was in this aria I, I, no no sorry it was in a later ar aria i think and so she very kindly was like you know i'm i just need a place to breathe somewhere you know and so you know we actually had to change where we wanted to cut so that she could have you know a few seconds to just you know get oxygen so um yeah it, it did affect things definitely
Uh, yes. Yes, I think it's a problem with Bach in general, Vicky. <laughs> Should we hear the next chunk? I swear I'm going to get you clean. You have to shun that evil being or no dessert for you. That's fine. Give me a latte, I'll make do. How about a bribe? Cut back your rations. Each cup that you give up will earn one of the latest fashion. The fashion I prefer is cold brew. I'll ground you, you like how that sounds, until you finally come to. Sure, ground me, just like coffee grounds, and pour the boiling water through. You've grown increasingly disturbed, this habit really must be curbed. Go straight to bed, no supper. It's fine, long as I've got my cup up. Oh, really, what's the use? While well, you're hopped up on devil juice. For I love my daughter dearly. Though I love her dearly, clearly, she's not thinking clearly. I love her dearly, clearly she's not thinking clearly, she's clearly not, no she's not, though I love my daughter dearly, although I love my dearest daughter dearly, clearly she's not thinking clearly. Dearly, clearly, she's not thinking clearly. No, she's not thinking clearly. She's lost within this camping haze. So lost within this camping haze. Let's pray it's just a phase. In this caffeine haze, let us pray it's just a face. Let's pray. Yes, let's pray it's just a face. Just a face. Just a face. Just a face. You're lost within this caffeine haze. I pray it's just. That coffee breath won't land a mate. So you've said I'm too young to date. You are, but I'll lift that restriction if you renounce your sick addiction. You mean, oh daddy, do you swear? If you quit coffee, fair is fair. And I will gladly give my blessing. Dreams come true, dreams come true. Here is death and 
So one person that we would like to give um, credit to is Mainrad Brennis. Mainrad, do you want to unmute yourself for a second? So, you know, we had these ideas like, you know, doing the bleep and the, the pixelating, the <laughs> pixelating the mouth and, and just, and I have to say, Mainrad has been just so patient with us. He's been, um, you know, he's just sat with us for hours and hours going over, um, you know, all of our requests and, and um, just, you know, he's a wizard. So thank you, Mainrad. Yeah, you're welcome. It's a lot of fun to do. And, you know, looking at all the pieces and all the hard work Marissa and David put that day and the, the performers, and Annie and Cedric and Chris, and just all the thought process of Maya and Kevin and Ben, and, and of course, you know, Vid's awesome interpretation of it. It's like it, the only thing I could do is just do it all justice. And, and after all that hard work and just makes, you know, help make sense of it all. And it was a lot of fun. And uh, I was commenting to uh, Kevin and Ben that part. I just, I, every time we edited that part, I just kept <laughs> laughing for it. <laughs> it really made it. Well, thank you for all of your work on this. And and just so everyone knows, I mean, Maiden Rat has, has his own company. He, I mean, if you need video editing, this is the guy to go to. And, um, you know, he's been our go-to person or editor for all of our projects during this, um, you know, COVID era. So he's the man. A lot of fun. <laughs> would like to say hello. <laughs> hey, Naomi. Oh, lovely. Hi, everybody. Hey, Philip. Thank you all so much for everything you have done. Yes, Lightning McQueen, we must tell you all, Galen has Lightning McQueen. You get nothing else from 2020, it's that. <laughs> um, Maya, can you check your email real fast? So just so everybody knows, um, you know, Maya mentioned this on a previous happy hour. Um, so, you know, Maya's daughter, Naomi, who's in the picture right now, she's going to have a procedure done um, in, let's see, in a week's time. And it's kind of a, a big deal. It's a big procedure. And um, a lot of people wanted to, um, you know, express their support and, um, and love for, for Maya and her family and Naomi. So, um, so we put together a card. So just you can open your email and take a look at that so much that's lovely all those actual notes yeah. wow. oh my gosh <laughs> you guys that's crazy Jesus. Much. Wow. What a great idea. Gosh. Oh my God. Wow. This is the first time I've gotten a, yeah. something like that. Oh my God. I'm really, uh, really uh, touched here. Okay. Galen, watch out. <laughs> hey, yes. I All will right. miss next week because of the operation. Um, but I'll be thinking of you guys. And gosh, if she's doing well, maybe I'll tune in on, on the iPad and maybe say hi. But thank you, have, everybody, so I much. A hug. Yes. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Of course. Oh, um, if any of the other performers want to, um, oh, I see Bernard, you're on. Nice. If anybody wants to um, just, you know, unmute themselves and just, you know, mention what it was like to work on this project, please, um, please unmute yourself before we play the final um, One thing, if I may jump in, yeah. Kevin, yes, um, just because I, I, this is something that I think is uh, is fairly clear to people who are um, uh, inclined towards things like rhyme and prosody and libretto construction. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to kind of point out the one brilliant thing. I, I love what you guys did with the bleep in there. <laughs> And I, I kind of want to just point out that from a libretto construction that where this where this comes from is that, um, and this is to the earlier question about things coming from music, this is kind of the exception almost that proves the rule in that in this is the one area where uh, in after writing the line or while I was writing the line, I looked at the music and I looked at how it fell. 
and I saw a great opportunity. There's there's a level of very subtle ribaldry in the in 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 the libretto. It's very subtle. It's not like De Ponte style, you know, mm-hmm. flat out. But um, there's some suggestiveness, and I, I wanted an opportunity to kind of liven it up. But I want to be very very clear that this was an opportunity that to kind of do a a misdirected line in that because um, of the way that it's constructed, it basically takes a double rhyme, which is an AA, and then it repeats the first line, AA, and then goes to A, right? In this particular case, I set that up for the first one with an AA and then repeat the A, but in the second one, it goes BB. And then instead of repeating the B, oh, what luck, oh, what luck, it introduces a D line. Finally, I, and it uses the long I, will be free to fly. So that's written into the score and that's the libretto writing to the music, right? Oh, what luck, oh, what luck, finally I will be free to fly. Now, if you're talking with people at the time, they would have known what to expect in that kind of construction. And this is where I was kind of playing with musical expectations in that if you kind of know how librettos are constructed, you know a basic form. Now, the truth is, I think what you guys have done is brilliant and I love your inspiration to bleep it because whereas people who are familiar with Baroque construction and classically structured poetry totally get the joke the moment she says, oh, what luck. Mm -hmm. The difference is that for contemporary audiences who are used to pop music, near rhyme does not give you the same, the way things are scanned, the way rhyme works, it doesn't necessarily set up contemporary ears to hear the same joke. Um, So I'm 100% in favor of what you guys did underlining the joke. Um, (laughs) Partially because it's so perfectly executed on every level. So like, I really, really respect the direction, acting, editing, all of that, Um, it lands. But um, sorry for talking so long on that front, but it just was one, I thought, multi-layered example of the way in which kind of playing with intention and actual um, form with performance and understanding how audiences work. It's one little line that to me just speaks uh, apparently for 10 minutes without stop since that's what I've done. So anyway, that's that. (laughs) No, I love, oh yes, Ben, go ahead. Here, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, just to, just to add to that, there's an additional uh, uh, layer now, which would only be uh, evident to anybody uh, tracking on the internet in the last four or five years, which is a whole uh, this whole subculture of uh, of unnecessary censorship, where people will take photographs or uh, speeches or whatever and bleep out certain words that then would imply that somebody something devious or uh, uh, perverse is going on. And, uh, and it's not at all, it's totally innocent. Uh, and so that, that adds a, a sort of additional level given the fact that this is a COVID uh, video uh, piece. But that was fun. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I would like to say that, you know, we had very sophisticated intentions <laughs> in believing that out. But honestly, we just thought it would be just, you know, just a funny kind of thing. Um, okay. That joke in the original, it's like the one line that's actually really funny still now where she says, if I don't have my cup of coffee three times a day, I will be grouchier than a roast goat or something. Yes, that's right. <laughs> it doesn't a, really a roasted goat. Up. It doesn't hold up, but it's it's like goat jerky. What? Where did that come from? And it yeah. just, tone just changes completely in that one line. But anyways, you know, we just that there is. All that is to say that like slapstick or kind of a weird curveball humor is kind of justified in the original too. Yeah. Um, let's see. Bernard, did you want to like say anything about what it was like to record the recits? Um, sure. Uh, uh, it, the project in general, I think it was a lot of fun for me. Um, and uh, initially um, I went into it thinking that the Orias were going to be no big deal and that they weren't essentially uh, sort of recording to a click track and then to the, tra- the, the 
the kind of rough and ready tracks you sent um, of the instrumentalists. The resets were in a different headspace for me because mm -hmm. I have never experienced accompanying reset that wasn't live in some form. And so I was going into it thinking, how can this possibly work? <laughs> and um, th this was uh, sort of the opposite uh, of the, the arias. The arias Yoshi recorded first, and then I added my, my bits. Mm -hmm. This one, um, I went first and then Yoshi, for the rest it's, uh, I recorded first and then Yoshi sort of uh, added his sort of lyrical uh, line to it. Um, and initially I thought, I. I sat there and I thought, well, if I listen to the recits enough, I'll be able to absorb them. And that's exactly what happened. And I was able to, the, 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 the difference, uh, I guess, from live recit and recorded is that live recit, anything can happen and singers um, take uh, their time or they're inspired by the moment and you react to what the moment um, uh, sort of demands offers or inspires in this sense i all i had to do was listen to it let's say 10 times and i knew that i could count on just uh laying down the track uh to what i had um listened to it the, the cadences were clear uh, all of the singers of course are experienced that was absolutely um uh, uh, uh evident immediately and so it was a lot of fun to realize that all of my sort of anxiety going into it was for not in general. <laughs> so lots of fun in the end. Yeah, well, thank you for, uh, you know, Bernard, uh, his, his um, harpsichord is uh, not accessible right now because um, UC Riverside, right? Has uh, like, you know, closed their campus. So he had to go out of his way and he really, um, he really went out of his way to, to help make this work. So thank you for that, Bernard. Thank you. And Curtis was also, Curtis, the, the owner of the harpsichord his shop, made it available and actually it um, was really something quite special to be in yeah. that space. If you've ever been to one of our live concerts, you would uh, we use Curtis's uh, harpsichords and you know he hand paints all the instruments. I mean, he, he builds them and he hand paints them. It's, it's an amazing kind of thing, so. Um, okay, should we listen to the last chunk? The father left and thought his girl was saved. The signature aroma faded. His daughter seemed so well behaved. He celebrated what he'd done, believing truly that he'd won. But that girl was one savvy sister. She kept her word while living in his house, but quickly found her future spouse. The sexy neighborhood barista. Worst temptation, 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 worst tem
So like Kevin said, we will have a um, version of this kind of like our little Christmas gift to our amazing community um, that you can just watch whenever you like and send along to anyone you think might be interested and we'll send that out by Christmas. Um, next week we have the pajama and, and hook up party that I'm very sad to miss. That was actually Meredith's idea. Meredith, I believe um, her exact words were something like, can't we just all wear PJs and talk about our fears? <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> i don't know that we'll do much talking about our fears maybe we will you know exercise them before 2021 comes around um but yeah we hope you enjoyed uh, the coffee cantata that we made the case for a loving and irreverently reverent adaptation of, of a chestnut um yeah Thank you for coming. And also, I, I have to say thank you so much for the beautiful card. I was re briefly reading through some during the video, and I can't really explain why, but it does make me feel more positive about the outcome somehow to feel just that it's real to so many more people than just like the peasy, scary shroud in my head. I mean, and Marissa yeah. didn't know this, but even today, the surgeon called to let me know that the hospital had asked if we could postpone the surgery because of COVID. Um, and uh, she told the hospital, I don't want to, but I'll ask the parents first. And we don't want to either. So we're for now, we're going to proceed as planned. Thank you so much for your kindness. It's really very felt and that's kind of uh, a, a something I get to be grateful for about this. Experience. Yeah. And, and, you know, this, I mean, the idea of, of sending that card came from the community. I mean, everybody wanted to send their support. So, yeah. So we wish you guys all the love and and luck and support, you know, for her surgery. Um, Thank you. Of course. Uh, Kevin and Marissa know this too, but because of COVID, uh, my husband can't even come visit. So I all the more so I appreciate just feeling support from other people. Yeah. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, you know, there are ways that you can, you know, uh, we mentioned that there's a ten thousand dollar matching gift today. Um, you know, these, uh, the cantata, these happy hours, everything that we're doing is, is, um, free for you, free to the public, free to everyone, but they're not free to produce. So, um, you know, your support is, is really appreciated. Thank you again to everyone, um, everyone who participated in this coffee cantata project. Um, if you would like to find a different way of supporting us also, you know, you can always just go on so social media. You can go on Facebook and give us, leave us a review. Um, you can you know, tell your friends about us. That's a big part of it. And when we release this online, um, you know, you can just tell everyone about it and, you know, we can get those YouTube views and all that kind of stuff. So thank you again and happy holidays. See you next week. <laughs>